I always get asked if it's weird being an orphan, if I miss my parents. But what people don't understand is that I lost my parents when I was three. I have little to no memories of them. My first memory is holding on to a caretaker's hand as I entered the orphanage I spent my childhood and early teenage years in. Hi there, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. We greatly appreciate it. The orphanage was pretty dull. My everyday routine was too repetitive. I woke up, showered, had breakfast in the dining hall by myself, and then went to school. Breakfast and lunch were a drag. None of the boys in my dormitory talked to me, and if they did, they would just taunt me. Eat up, Skelly, they'd say while tossing their half-eaten food onto my tray. They made fun of me for being a skinny guy, saying I looked like a skeleton. School was no better. I went to a terrible public school because it was free. I had to pinch myself to keep from falling asleep because the teachers all seemed to hate their job and would only teach by reading out a slideshow. I already knew everything they taught because I took it upon myself to learn, knowing my teachers were all useless. You cheated on the last test, didn't you? My history teacher asked me one time. Everyone else failed it and you got a perfect score. Admit you cheated. He knew his teaching was terrible. So bad that he was surprised when I got good scores. Sir, I just taught myself. I know you don't teach, so I might as well do it, I replied. That, of course, landed me in detention. But detention was in the school library, where I spent most of my time anyways. It wasn't nearly as good as the city's library, though. That's where I went every day after school to teach myself. It was heaven to me. I could almost hear angels singing and harps playing every time I walked through the doors. One day, I was returning to the orphanage after going to the library. I checked out loads of books, a stack so big I could barely see over it. I bumped into someone where I expected to bump into the gate. I put my books down and immediately apologized. It was a man in a dark coat and sunglasses. He took them off to get a better look at me. He had a really charming smile. The woman, who I guessed was his wife, came out from behind him. They looked like a couple you'd see in a movie. No worries, buddy, the man said after I apologized. They were ringing the doorbell, but no one answered. I also wanted to go in and put the books in my room. Don't tell anybody about this or I'll get in trouble, I said to them before doing the trick I always used to open the gate to the orphanage. I stuck a paperclip in the lock and jiggled it around while kicking the door lightly with one foot. The lock popped and the gate flew open. It'll be our secret, said the woman with a smile. What's your name? She asked me. I'm Donnie, I answered. I then entered the building and ran up to my dormitory. I wasn't getting my hopes up about that couple. They probably wanted to adopt a baby like everybody else. I didn't expect to be wrong about that. I was almost devouring one of the books I got when the door opened. I was immediately irritated to see Jerry, one of the people who worked at the orphanage, Donnie, you're being requested downstairs. There's a couple wanting to meet you, he said. It was the last thing I expected him to say. Are you sure it's me? It could be Donnie S or Donnie W, I said, because I really didn't believe him. They wanted the Donnie with the books, so that must be you, said Jerry, growing irritated. Come on, I don't have time for this, he said. I finally believed him and walked downstairs after him. I went into the office where the director was and saw that the couple who wanted to meet me were the same ones I met at the door. I was suddenly excited. They seemed really cool. Donnie, meet Mr. and Mrs. Crum, said the director before leaving us to get to know each other. We talked for about half an hour and it felt completely natural. After around a month of legal procedures, they took me home with them. I was so happy. I met my adoptive brother and sister. My brother was a few years younger and my sister was older. They didn't look like the crumbs, but they looked like each other, so I guessed the crumbs adopted a pair of siblings. I started going to school after I got settled into my new home. It was intimidating. I didn't know if I could adjust to proper education, but it was fantastic. All I got was praise. My teachers were all surprised at how much I knew and that I was even ahead in the syllabus. My life at home was nice too. It was super sweet to have a room of my own, but something felt off. The crumbs were never around. Sometimes I'd go days without seeing them, only communicating with them through notes left on the fridge. 
I talked to my siblings, Melanie and Jasper. Melanie was too stressed trying to figure out what to study in college, and Jasper was too busy working out to improve his stamina to notice that the crumbs were never around. Listen, Donnie, we're just glad we didn't get split up. Many wanted only me or only Jasper, but the crumbs took both of us. That's enough, said Melanie after I had been pestering her for a long time. But I still wanted to know why they were never around. I snuck into the crumbs' room one night. They almost never slept at home, so I was safe. I was digging through Mr. Crumb's nightstand when the door opened. I ducked down and rolled under the bed. I heard both of them yawn and fall onto the bed. All this traveling is killing me, said Mrs. Crumb. I know, me too, replied Mr. Crumb. They were silent for a few minutes and then I heard them snoring. I crawled from under the bed and out the door, pretending I was coming from the bathroom. A different day, I snuck into the study. I found a photo album in a drawer. The first picture was the crumbs when they were kids. They were with two couples, probably their parents. In the next picture, they were much older. They were standing with three kids on a beach. Are those their kids? I wondered. There were countless pictures like that. They were also in a bunch of different houses. How did they know so many kids? Something smelled fishy. What did they want so many kids for? I was creeped out. I put the book back where I found it and left, trying to forget about it. I couldn't help it though. I hid whenever the crumbs came home. A few times, I even grabbed Melanie and Jasper and asked them to go to the store with me. They ignored me whenever I tried to warn them that the crumbs were up to something. Can you blame me for not trusting them? There's very few reasons why someone would want so many kids, and none of them are pretty. I feared for my life, but everyone seemed to think I was losing it. I wasn't. I swore I wasn't. I kept thinking about that book. I was distracted while standing at my locker in school when someone slammed the door shut, barely missing my fingers. Dude, what the hell? I shouted when I saw the guy who did it. He was around my age. He shoved me so my back hit the lockers. People started staring. You stole my parents, shouted the guy. Dude, I don't even know you. What are you on about? I shouted back. The guy swung at me, but I dodged his fist and swung right back. Soon enough, we were rolling on the floor, fighting, and two teachers had to split us up and took us to the principal's office. I'm disappointed in you boys, said the principal. He attacked me, I explained to her. That's no reason for you to attack back, she reprimanded me. I crossed my arms and sunk into my chair. She called both our parents. After a few minutes, she told us that the two couples and she had decided that suspension for two weeks was a good enough punishment. The principal watched the guy and me leave to make sure we wouldn't fight again, at least not on school grounds. I took the bus home and he rode his bike away. The beginning of my suspension was chill. I was enjoying the time at home, but not even three hours in, I started losing my mind. Ugh, I'm missing out on dissecting a goat eye, I complained to myself. I started thinking of ways to spend the time. Studying was of no use because I was ahead in every class. I was banging my head against my desk trying to think of something to do when a light bulb lit up over my head. I grabbed a paper and my pencil case and started sketching and designing. After an hour, I had designed a small GPS to track the crumbs with. All I needed now was the materials to build it and I knew exactly where to get everything I needed. After a few hours, school was over. I was dressed in all black and the sun was starting to go down so I could hide in the shadows. I knew the window to the janitor's shed was easy to slide open so I climbed in through there and found the keys to the main building. I crawled around and avoided the cameras all I could. It was difficult but I made it into the robotics lab. I got to work and since everything was already on paper, I just had to follow my own instructions and assemble the GPS. It was easy enough. I stuffed it into my duffel bag and snuck back out of the school, leaving no evidence behind. The crumbs gave me chores to do at home as part of my punishment. One of them was mowing the lawn, which was the perfect opportunity to plant my GPS under their car. Good luck, buddy, I whispered to it. I felt like it was my child. It was almost hard to say goodbye. Mr. Crumb almost saw me, but I got lucky and spotted a tennis ball under the car, so I pretended I was just grabbing it from under there. 
When I was done mowing the lawn, I ran upstairs and used my laptop to activate the GPS. The location was so accurate, I had to give myself a pat on the back. When the crumbs left home, I tracked their every move. They drove all around town all day long. They spent no more than an hour in each location, the same amount of time they usually spent at home. The laptop even tracked their locations when I was asleep. So, next morning, I saw that they spent half the night in one place and the rest of the night in another. It was so strange. I could tell this wasn't business related because they went to residential areas. Why residential areas? Is that where they kept the kids? Were the others locked up in basements? What if Melanie, Jasper, and I were the only lucky ones who got to live in a house? I wanted to go check out the houses myself, but what if I got caught? What if I tried freeing the kids from cages in a basement and got locked up in one myself? I tracked their location and saw a pattern. I waited until it was time for them to come home and at dinner that night, I confronted them. Why are you never here? I questioned. You're never with us. I'm the only one who sees that Melanie is having a mental breakdown over choosing a career and Jasper probably has asthma. The kid can't run up the stairs without wheezing, I shouted at them. They were dumbfounded. I could almost see the gears in their brains trying to come up with excuses. I put my knife and fork down and ran up to my room. I was so frustrated. I plopped down on the floor trying to calm myself down. I was more angry for my siblings. I was independent, but those two needed help. There was a soft knock on my door and then the crumbs came in and sat across from me on the floor. It's time we told one of you the truth, said Mrs. Crumb. We've been hiding it for too long. They started explaining their life story to me. They were both the children of two extremely wealthy families. They grew up together and then went to the same orphanage when their parents died in a car crash. They fell in love and finally had access to their parents' money when they turned 18. They decided that they would adopt as many kids as possible and take care of them the way they wished they were taken care of when they became orphans. So you don't adopt kids to keep them in cages? I asked. No, gosh, we do the opposite, Mrs. Crumb said, chuckling at the end. Suddenly, it all made sense. The guy who attacked me at school must have found out about me and gotten jealous or defensive. But you're right, Don, we need to spend more time with you guys, all of you, Mr. Crumb said. We promise we'll figure something out, said Mrs. Crumb, and they did. Within a month, the Crumbs bought an apartment building. We all moved in, all of us. I had at least 50 siblings. We all shared an apartment with one or two others. I stayed with Melanie and Jasper. Our parents got the top floor, so they were only an elevator ride away. The ground floor was converted into a common room where we could all get together and spend time together. I even made peace with the guy who attacked me. We actually have a lot in common. I went up to the penthouse one day. My parents were in their living room. They got up to greet me, so I ran towards them and gave them a big hug. Thank you, I said. Before I met them, I was alone and had no prospects at all. With them in my life, I have a huge, loving family and a bright future ahead. My name is Ishan, and I think I'm from India. At least that's what a note from my biological parents said. I don't remember them at all. When I was about two years old, I was found wandering around LA International Airport all by myself. I had a little backpack and a sealed envelope in my hands. A concerned worker picked me up and announced on the loudspeaker that they had found a lost child, but no one came to claim me. She took the envelope from my hand and opened it. There was a note which read, This is our son Ishan. We recently arrived here, but we cannot afford to take care of him. So we have left him in the airport, hoping that a generous soul will take him in. Before I continue, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more awesome content. I'm 15 now, and all I remember is growing up among lots of other children in a home run by a man called Mr. Arthur. I always struggled with identity issues because I looked different from everyone else. Henry was the worst. He was about three years older than me, and he was sent to the orphanage around the same time. He'd constantly taunt and bully me, and he'd say the most awful things too. I knew I should have tried to toughen up, but I'm a sensitive guy and it was hard. 
Until one day after lunch, we were all playing in the backyard when he came and shoved me to the ground. Why don't you go back to where you came from, Indian boy? He said. How can you say that to me when you don't even have a clue where you came from or who your parents are? We're in the same situation here, idiot. I shouted back at him. I got off the ground and punched him in the face. He instantly fell down and started screaming. Then I looked at my hand and realized it was covered in blood. I had knocked out his tooth. Oh no, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble, I thought. Henry was Mr. Arthur's favorite and I knew he'd probably do something horrible to me. Without thinking anything through, I ran up to the bedroom, put a few of my things in a bag and ran out of the house. Hey, Ishan, where are you going? One of the kids said, but I ignored her and continued running. I ran as fast as my legs could take me until I was finally out of breath. I looked around and had no idea where I was. Well, I guess the rest of my life begins today. I'll have to find a way to fend for myself, I thought, while I walked around looking for a spot to sleep for the night. I settled on an old bench in front of a laundromat, took out my book, and began reading. I don't even remember what book it was, but I loved reading, and it always helped me calm down. After a couple of chapters, I dozed off. When I opened my eyes hours later, a very fat cop was in front of my face and staring at me like he'd seen a ghost. Do you think it's him, Bob? Someone called from behind. Yeah, I think so. Hey, kid, did you run away from home after knocking somebody's tooth out? He asked. I swallowed my heart. I didn't know what to do. There was nowhere to run because the man was simply too huge. Yeah, it's me, I sighed. Great, now let's get you home so I can go buy some donuts. You kids need to learn to stop running away for every little thing. He shook his head as he led me towards the cop car. When I arrived home, Mr. Arthur was standing at the door looking puzzled. Thank you so much for bringing him back, he said to the cops who sped off hungrily. Ishan, I'm very disappointed in you. Come to my office upstairs. I have something to discuss with you, he said. Oh no, that's it. He's going to give me some horrible punishment, I thought. We went upstairs and when we walked into the office, there was a very ordinary looking couple sitting there. Mr. Arthur asked me to sit next to them, then sat down in front of his desk. Ishan, you probably think that you're in big trouble today, but you're not. Actually, I have a bit of good news. This lovely couple here would like to adopt you. If you agree, you will be able to leave with them today. They have no other children and they're quite wealthy. In fact, I wish they'd adopt me instead, he chuckled. Was this really happening? Was I really about to be adopted? They could have chosen any other child and they chose me. My thoughts were all over the place, but I decided that it would be better to be anywhere but there with awful Henry in that stupid home. I never wanted to see him again. Um, hi, I smiled at the couple. I take that as a yes then, said Mr. Arthur. You already packed your bag before you ran off, so you're more or less ready, aren't you? You can leave as soon as you please. I'll give you all a few minutes to get acquainted, he continued, then left. Hi, son. It's a pleasure to meet you. I've heard you're such a clever boy and that you love reading. It's why we chose you, actually. We're intellectuals and we like to surround ourselves with smart people. We have a huge library, which we're sure you'll love. My name is Mrs. Porter, by the way, but you can call me Emily. And this is my husband, Charles, the woman said, smiling the entire time. Hi, Ishan. Welcome to our little family. Well, let's go, Charles said. We found Mr. Arthur downstairs and said goodbye. They walked me to their huge car and we all sat in the back because apparently these people were rich enough to afford a chauffeur. The seats were so comfortable that I fell asleep right away. When I woke up, I was staring at a mansion. Well, son, this is your new home, Emily squealed. I couldn't understand why they were so excited to have me. She showed me around their luxurious home, then led me to my room, which was bigger than a whole floor at Mr. Arthur's home for abandoned children. I had everything a guy could dream of. All the latest gaming consoles, a really expensive gaming chair, Alienware computers, but most importantly for me, lots of bookshelves filled with books I'd never read before. The library downstairs was already massive and I had my own? I felt like I was in a dream. I had my own bathroom which had a hot tub and a huge window where I had a great view. I had a walk-in closet filled with hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of outfits. This was definitely going to be a change for me as I only had like four shirts and two pairs of pants. 
Look, you have this too, Emily smiled. She pointed me towards a huge vending machine filled with snacks and drinks. It's so you don't always have to go to the kitchen when you're hungry. You don't need to put any money inside to use it. Just press the button and you get what you want, she said. How is it different from an ordinary fridge then, I asked. Well, I just thought this was way cooler. Anyway, you can get changed and come downstairs for dinner later, she laughed. Emily, I just wanted to say thank you for all of this. I feel like I won the lottery or something. Thank you so much, I said as she walked towards the door. Don't mention it, darling, she winked. The first few days were amazing. I spent my time touring their estate and checking out the different books. I was never the gaming type, but since I had all that awesome equipment in my room, I decided to test it all out. I must have gained about 15 pounds. I had three course meals a day, plus tons of snacks from my vending machine. This was the life. It was around the second week I started to realize that something was wrong with my adoptive parents. One evening after dinner, I was in my room getting ready for bed. Help! Help! Emily screamed. I ran towards the screams, then saw my adoptive mom on the floor in her bedroom crying. What's wrong? I asked. There are whales in the bath, humongous ones, and I'm terrified. I don't know what to do. Can you get them out? She cried. Whales? In the bath? I asked. Go and check for yourself. Charles, Charles, where is my husband? Oh no, maybe the whales have gotten him. Charles! She continued screaming. I was confused as hell, but I went to the bathroom to check. The bathtub was filled with water and lots of bubbles. I put my hand inside and felt all around. Emily, there's nothing in there, I said. You're awful. Go to your room, she cried. I was so confused. The next morning at breakfast, she smiled at me and everyone behaved like she hadn't made a scene the night before. Part of me wondered if I had dreamt it all. I tried to go about my day as usual, hoping that everything would be normal again, but I had no luck. That night, Charles barged into my room, looking terrified. Ishan, pack a bag of your favorite things. They are coming to get us. We need to hide, he said. Who is coming to get us? I asked. Hurry up, we have no time, he screamed. I packed a bag and followed him to a basement I didn't even know existed. There, Emily was already sitting in the dark, crying. It's okay, honey. They don't know about the basement, Charles said as he tried to comfort his wife. They won't find us down here. Is anyone going to tell me who's coming for us and why? I asked, but they both glanced at me angrily. I lost track of time, but I think we stayed down there for about five days. The maid would leave our food by the door and Charles would open it once a day. Then one day, Charles and Emily left the basement, asked me to follow them and continued living their happy, normal lives like the last five days had not happened. I was starting to get really freaked out by these two, so I tried to stay in my room as much as possible. I'd only seen them at mealtimes, and even then, they'd horrify me. One evening, we were having fries and hot dogs. I poured some ketchup over my fries, and they both froze and stared at me. What do you think you're doing? They asked. Um, putting ketchup on my fries? I said. You're doing it wrong. You're supposed to inject it. Barbara, bring me my syringe, Emily shouted. The maid brought a syringe, and Emily filled it up with ketchup. Then, she simply injected herself with the ketchup while eating a fry. At that point, I didn't think it could get any weirder, but it did. I went to bed really early that night because I wanted to dream and forget about my new parents who seemed to be complete psychopaths. I was sleeping soundly until I heard voices. I'm a very light sleeper. That's not how you do it. Shh, you'll wake him, a voice whispered. I opened my eyes very slightly and saw Emily holding a flashlight, which gave off a green type of light. Charles had a huge scalpel in one hand and a pair of forceps in the other. Be quiet, Emily. You'll wake him. We really need his kidney to ward off the vampires, Charles said. What? I screamed. Are you guys planning to operate on me? I shouted as I shot up and raced out the door. Sweetie, no, it's not like that. Please, come back, Emily said kindly. I ran out of the house and kept running until I found a main road. I signaled to the first car that passed and I was lucky enough to get a ride from a stranger. I asked him to take me to Mr. Arthur's. We got there in no time. I ran up the steps and knocked on the door. Ah, I see, you've made it out alive, Mr. Arthur laughed. Wait, you knew these people were crazy? I asked. Of course, that was your punishment for running away. Now get inside and clean yourself up, he said. 
I was too shocked to say anything. I don't know what became of Emily and Charles after that. I never went to the police because I didn't think they'd believe me. I still live at Mr. Arthur's, which really sucks, but at least my experience with the porters toughened me up and I can stand up for myself a bit more. Plus, Henry's afraid to get another tooth knocked out, so there's that. I loved my parents, even though we were poor and rarely went to bed on a full stomach. We were happy because we had each other. They were always so kind and loving and never let their poverty get in the way of having a good life. I always admired them for that. But then something happened and they disappeared and my life changed forever. But before I go on, make sure you like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any more crazy stories. I was 15 years old and my parents had gone out. We lived in a really rough neighborhood, so it was risky leaving me on my own. But my mom had to go to work and my dad was out at the store buying groceries. They had no choice. I waited in our tiny living room, which was actually my bedroom. You see, our house had only one bedroom, so I had to use the couch in the living room as my bed. While I waited for my parents to come home, I wasted time staring out the window, watching my neighbors go about their daily lives. We didn't have a TV or a phone or anything electronic for that matter, so I had to tend to my boredom by looking out on the world. It was 6 o'clock at night, and it was time for my parents to come home. My mom usually arrived at this hour, and my dad always got back before dark, so it was strange to find them late. Another hour passed by, and still my parents hadn't returned. Where were they? I was starting to panic. What if my mom had gotten into an accident on the way home from work, and my dad was now at the hospital with her? What if my dad had gotten mugged on his way home from the grocery store, and now my mom was at the hospital with him? All these crazy thoughts zoomed through my head, and I struggled to stay calm. I had a really bad feeling in the bottom of my stomach, like something really bad was about to happen. But I just didn't know what. Well, my instincts were right. Something really bad did happen. My parents had disappeared. They hadn't returned for the rest of the night, and so I called the cops because I was really worried about them. The cops investigated, and according to my mom's workplace, she had left like usual after her shift and headed home. The grocery store said that they had seen my dad and he had left like usual to walk home. It didn't make any sense. Why were both of my parents missing? The police tracked their route, but they couldn't find any clues as to why or how they had disappeared. Is there anyone that may have something against your parents? An enemy, perhaps? Asked one of the police officers. I shook my head. No, of course not. Everyone loved my parents. That night, I had to sleep at an emergency foster home where there were a dozen other kids too. The foster parents were nice enough, but I was too worried about my parents to behave normally. That night, I cried myself to sleep. The next day, the police still had no leads on where my parents had gone. At first, I felt like this was all just a dream. It had to be, surely. This could not be real. This was only something that happened in the movies, but not in real life. But no matter how many times I pinched myself, I never woke up from my dream. This was it. This was my life. My parents had disappeared. For weeks, I drifted from foster home to foster home, never really finding a place where I felt like I belonged. But eventually, my caretakers told me that there was a family who were looking to adopt, and they were actually asking to see me personally. I thought that was strange. Why me, of all people? But they explained that the family had heard of my case and how my parents had disappeared, and they had felt a connection instantly. The next day, I met up with them. When I first saw them, I instantly knew they were rich. For starters, they were all wearing high-quality clothing and expensive jewelry, and the kids even had AirPods. They all spoke in a rather posh way as well, which was something I wasn't too used to. But I don't know what it was, but I felt like we got along really well. Just from that first meeting, the dad and I got chatting and we were pretty much well acquainted by the end of the first hour. The mom was really nice too, as well as the kids. I wasn't so sure though. I still missed my parents terribly and I longed to find them or at least know why they left. But I guessed that this was my only chance of ever having a family ever again. So in the next meeting with the Rich family, when they asked me if I'd like to be adopted, I said yes. Within a few days, I had already moved into their mansion. It was huge. 
They had 10 bedrooms, 8 bathrooms, an indoor cinema, a jacuzzi, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, a massive garden, two horses, their own personal tennis court, and, to top it all off, a pet peacock. Yep, they were rich. I was so overwhelmed at first. All my life, I had lived in poverty, and yet, now, I had moved to one of the richest homes in the country. I couldn't believe my luck. But then again, my misfortune at losing my parents. But the sight of this spectacular home helped improve my mood. I had two sisters now. They were both older than me, but they were still very nice and even offered to show me around the property. After the tour, my mom, although I still preferred to call her by her name, Doris, baked a cake to celebrate my adoption. My dad, his name was Keith, asked me to come for a swim with him in the pool. And it was so much fun. We even ended up wrestling for a bit, something I hadn't done in ages. I was really looking forward to living here. At first, yes, things were amazing. But alas, like all good things, they must come to an end. After a while, the mom and sisters started to turn a little mean. It was gradual at first, but then they started scowling at me, giving me dirty looks as we passed in the hallways. At first, I thought I was imagining things, but I swear I saw one of the sisters stare at me for a full minute with hatred. Keith still acted normal, I guess, but I could tell tensions were rising in the home. What had changed? Were they bored of me? Maybe they didn't want to adopt me after all. But then something happened that was very, very strange. One day, Doris called a family meeting. I was curious to see what was about to happen. When I entered the living room, Doris, my sisters, and Keith were already there. Hello, Andrew, Doris said coolly. Please, sit down. I sat down on the couch with the others sitting on the other side. What's wrong? I asked. Oh, nothing, mate, said Keith casually. We were just, we thought we should have a little chat. About what? I asked. About your parents, said Doris. Andrew, we understand that your parents went missing several months ago. I felt very <sighs> sad all of a sudden. Yes, that's right. We thought we should have a discussion about it. Might be therapeutic, you know? So, Doris took a deep breath. Did your parents ever tell you something secretive? She asked. What? I asked incredulously. Like the location of a mafia gang or something? Asked one of my sisters. Are you crazy? What are you even talking about? I asked. Andrew, there's no need to be rude. Just answer the questions, said Doris. I was stunned. What was wrong with these people? Who asked questions like that? Look, I said, my parents never said anything about mafia gangs or whatever. Why do you even want to know anyway? Oh, no reason, said Doris. That will be all. Then, without a word, Doris and my sisters left the room. Keith was still sitting there, and he looked very uncomfortable. What's going on, Keith? I asked. He opened his mouth as if to say something, but then closed it. And then eventually, he too left the room. I was still shocked. What on earth had just happened? Then, that night, something even stranger happened. I was in my bedroom when I started hearing noises downstairs. It sounded like someone was shouting, but their voice was muffled. It sounded like a ghost. I was quite superstitious, so I was terrified to go downstairs. But eventually, I mustered up enough courage to check it out. I went into the kitchen, but there was no one there. Then to the living room, and still no sign of anybody. But then the noises sounded again, and they seemed to be coming from the office. I went inside and pressed my ear against the wall. It sounded like they were on the other side of this wall. But that didn't make any sense. There was nothing on the other side of this wall, only the garden. Then I stepped up to the bookcase and noticed that one book was slightly off-center. I pushed it into place, and then something happened that made my jaw drop. The wall started to move. The wall moved sideways and revealed a secret tunnel leading underground. Now the sounds were even louder and it seemed like they were crying for help. I rushed down the hallway and you wouldn't believe what I discovered. My parents, my real parents, were locked in a cage. I cried out in surprise when I saw them and when they saw me, they burst into tears. Andrew, are you okay? I was so worried, said mom. I worked quickly and eventually I found a key that unlocked the cage. They escaped, but before we even had time to say hello, we heard a noise behind us. And there was Doris with the rest of her family behind her. She immediately locked us all in the cage, and now we were all trapped. When they left, I asked my parents to explain what on earth was going on. We're spies, 
said Dad. I know, I know, it's hard to believe, but your mother and I are spies. We're not really poor. That's just our disguise, so people like Doris don't find us. You see, we've been spying on a mafia gang, and someone ratted us out. <gasps> Doris and her family kidnapped us because she's part of the mafia gang we were spying on. I realized that must be why she'd been asking about a mafia gang before. This rich family adopted you so that they could get information out of you too, said mom. But luckily for you, we never told you anything about our secret life. Oh darling, I'm so sorry. At that point, Keith came downstairs to check on us and bring us some dinner. I tried to persuade him to help us. I always felt like he had a soft spot for me. Please, Keith, let us out. We just want to be free, I begged. Keith seemed torn. But after I pleaded and begged for a few more minutes, finally he relented. Keith grabbed the key and let us out of the cage, saying he never even liked this life of crime anyway. I thanked him, we hugged, and I immediately grabbed a phone and called the police. Later that day, the police burst into the mansion and arrested everyone, sadly including Keith. But later on, I was able to lessen his sentence in prison since he had helped us escape. Well, that's it. That's my crazy story about how I lost my parents and was adopted by a very rich family. Crazy, right? What did you think? What would you have done in my situation? Let me know in the comments below. Oh, yeah, and don't forget to like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. My life turned out to be complicated and chaotic when I turned 16. It was then that I figured out a deep secret about myself that everyone in my family knew about except for me. My parents were very rich business people who had to travel all of the time, so they didn't have any time for me. Because of that, as soon as I was born, they had hired a woman as my nanny who took care of me and looked after me and a man as my driver who drove me around everywhere I needed to go, from doctor's appointments to school. But later when I joined the volleyball team in school, he turned into my home coach and would help me practice at home as my dad should have. But I didn't have any complaints against my parents because the people they hired were very good at their jobs of raising me. But before we move on, like this video, hit that subscribe button, and activate the notification bell, and you will soon find out an interesting secret about yourself. Trust me, it works. Ever since I was small, we would go to the parks twice a week, and they would even take me to amusement parks and zoos occasionally because my parents would never take me. And the most disappointing thing of all was that my parents would never even show up for my birthday. But my nanny would never forget it and was always there to cheer me up. She would bake me a cake from scratch every other birthday, and that meant a lot to me. However, it was not that my parents never took me anywhere. They did take me to luxurious vacations on islands and big cities, but I didn't like or enjoy them at all. First, because they always treated me like one of their expensive showpieces and only cared about getting professional shot pictures for their social media. And as I got older, my mom would put a lot of makeup on me, which I was not comfortable with at all. Come on, it'll make you look more beautiful. I need to make my friends jealous. She would reply every time I told her not to put much makeup on me. The second reason I didn't enjoy my vacation with them was that they would always leave out my nanny and driver who actually cared about me and the things I enjoyed. There was no doubt that I was closer to the people that my parents hired to raise me than my parents themselves. I don't know if it was because I was so close to them or that I even looked a bit like them, and especially because my friends always saw my driver when he was driving and picking me up from school. They would joke about it all the time. Get your DNA tested, my friend said sometimes, and sometimes it would be a little brutal like, I think your mom was unfaithful to your dad, and they would laugh about it, leaving me all embarrassed. However, I admit the truth that even I used to think about how I had the same facial structures as my driver multiple times, as well as it would get me all confused. But when I turned 16, everything was clear to me. One day, I was going through my father's things in his office because I needed a book of his relating to business for my schoolwork. I was having a hard time finding a specific book because there were so many. But then something else caught my eye. There, inside a drawer, was a big pile of papers. So I started going through them thinking the book might be there. But while looking, I found something else. There was a large envelope with adoption papers written on it. Why would my parents have this? I thought as I was a bit confused. And I was more curious than ever, so I quickly opened it without thinking. But when I did, I got the shock of my life. The adoption papers had my name written on it. I couldn't take it, so I sat in the nearest chair and started processing it. I am adopted? How could my parents hide this from me? I thought and went through the papers again and found out that was not just it. 
There was more to add to the shock, and you would not believe it. I discovered that my biological parents were none other than my nanny and my driver, who were with me all the time, the people my parents hired to raise me. I wasn't mad at the fact that they were my real parents, but I was mad because all of them hid the truth from me for so long. Why did they do this? I thought and sat there going through the papers trying to make sense of things, of why my real parents gave me up for adoption but then raised me as my nanny and driver. I stayed there for a good few hours trying to think of a reason, but I couldn't think of anything. Why did they choose to make this so complicated? I thought, and I knew that there was only one person I could go to at the time who could give me an answer. My nanny, aka my biological mother. I might have asked my adopted mother too, but as usual, they were not home for the week. And who am I kidding? I was closer to my biological mom anyway. So I got up from there with the papers in my hand and stormed out of the room and went directly to the kitchen where she was cooking dinner for me. Please stop whatever you are doing and explain to me what this is. I said as soon as I entered the kitchen and slammed the adoption papers on the table. She saw the papers and as she saw them, her face turned red and she went all silent. It was clear that she was as shocked as me, but for different reasons, of course. But then I demanded to know the truth from her. It was supposed to be a secret. Oh, it was supposed to be a secret, she said and started getting a little panicky. So I calmed her down and told her that I had already figured out the truth and just wanted the explanation. Then she took a deep breath and started explaining everything to me. She told me that she and my biological father were young and unmarried when they got pregnant with me, and they were from really conservative families, so they had to run away without any money or anything. So they were in a new city with absolutely nothing, thus extremely poor. We didn't have money to buy a nutritious meal needed for a pregnant woman. It was then that we realized that we would not be able to give you a good life, she said and began crying, but continued speaking. Then we made a decision that was really hard for us to make. She said, she told me that for my good, they decided to put me up for adoption while I was still in the womb, listing the condition that the adoptee had to take care of the mother. And that was how they met my legal parents. As I already said, my parents were rich and successful, but they were unsuccessful in having a baby. They had tried having a baby multiple times, but they failed and nothing worked no matter how much money they spent. So they gave up and chose to adopt instead. However, they wanted to have an infant for whatever their reasons were. So when they met my biological parents, they felt more than happy that my biological parents felt blessed. My legal parents were willing to do anything to have a baby in their house, so they gave my birth parents everything they required to bring a healthy baby in this world. Good food, a safe place to live, and whatnot. But time passed and my birth mom was going from one month to another with me. With each passing day, I was getting more and more attached to you, and my love for you only grew. She said and told me that it was then when she started second-guessing the decision regarding the adoption. However, there were other contributing factors, too, that made my birth mom overthink. She was concerned about how my parents were obsessed with social media and being famous. It got her wondering if they really wanted to fill a hole in their lives or to build their reputation instead. Then she told me that she started fearing if I would have a good life filled with happiness and people to love and care or not. So she made another deal with my adoptive mom because of her worries. She asked her to let them raise me. The deal was that it would all be professional and that the baby, me, would be like any other kid she would be a nanny to. But my adoptive mom was not sure about the idea until my birth mom told her that the adoption will be off of the table otherwise. She even offered to pay them and hire them as my nanny and driver. My adoptive mom was desperate to have a baby in her life. However, she did have a demand of her own too. She wanted all of this to be a secret, she said, and especially she didn't want you to even get a hint. She continued talking. She also told me that if I found out in any way, my adoptive parents were going to fire them, and they feared not having me in their lives, so they went along with the secret. After telling me the entire story, she started sobbing again and begged me not to discuss it with the adoptive parents. And after getting my answers and understanding why everything happened, I promised her that I would never speak of it ever again and hugged her. In my heart, I was very happy that the person I was so close to more than my parents was my biological mom and dad. Then after that, things went back to the way it was, and we started living our lives normally as we used to. Until one day, it was my mother's day, and I had two mothers to show my appreciation to, and I planned to give them gifts according to their taste. So I got my adoptive mom an expensive designer bag that would look great to take on her business trips. She was very happy to get it and instantly took a picture of it to send to her friends. And for my birth mom, I booked her a spa day with me, 
because I knew she loved spending time with me and I wanted her to have a good day. So we went to the spa and got all good massages and face packs. We got our nails done and after that, we went for a nice dinner with all three of us, my birth mom, dad, and me. Then we went back home. But when we got home, to our surprise, my adoptive parents were there waiting for us. It was a surprise because they were supposed to leave for another country that day in the afternoon. Where have you been all day? My adoptive mom asked as soon as she saw us walk in. We went for a spa day, I said, trying not to make it sound like a big deal, but I could tell by the look on her face that she was jealous and mad. And what she did next made it crystal clear. Well, it's good you took your nanny for a spa day, because we won't be needing her anymore, she said, suggesting she was going to fire her. My birth mom <laughs> immediately started crying and begging her not to do that, and I felt so bad seeing her that way, I had to do something about it. If they leave, I'm going with them. I know who she is, so please don't compel me to choose, I said, and my adoptive mom looked at me in shock. We have done so much for you, and you still want to go with them, she said. The only good thing you did for me was hire my birth parents to raise me. I replied and started walking out. However, she was not going to let me go, so she instantly took back her words and asked me not to go anywhere. So I stopped, but I was not done. I made it clear that my birth parents were treated like family from then on, and not a nanny and a driver, and that we do all things together like a family. My adoptive parents agreed to all my demands, and since then, we started living happily like a family. Thanks for watching. Has anyone ever kept a deep secret from you? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe and check out other videos on the channel. The last fond memory I have of my parents is that day at the zoo when I was little. I had an ice cream cone in one hand, and my parents took pictures of me next to a huge giraffe. <laughs> then they left. I remember waving goodbye to them from the door as they drove away for their vacation. I remember jumping around the house doing whatever I wanted. I remember crying that night thinking, what if they never come back? Please take a second to hit that like and subscribe button below to let us know you like these stories and hit the bell to be notified when a new one is out. When school started that year, I was a mess. My clothes were ripped and old and I hadn't slept properly in days. People sat away from me in class because I stunk. I was just a little girl with barely any money. What was I supposed to do? A few days later, I was watching TV when I heard the doorbell ring. They're back, I thought, rushing to the door. But when I opened it, I saw a strange lady. Now I know she was a social worker. I was put in an orphanage, having to share a room with five other girls. I kept telling everyone I talked to that my parents were coming back. I knew they were. They just gave me looks full of pity and told me to go play. About a year passed before I was adopted. I was called to an office and I was introduced to a glamorous lady in a fur coat. I shook her hand, but she actually expected me to kiss it. She took me home and she lived in a mansion. I met her husband and her two sons. The boys, or I guess my brothers, were always super nice to me, but my adoptive dad barely looked at me. My adoptive mother took me up to my room which was bright pink. It was the epitome of a stereotypical little girl room, to the point that it was offensive. I told her I didn't even like pink, but she said I'd get used to it and left me there. Her name was Serafina. Fancy, right? Serafina tried to be a normal mom to me. She treated her sons and me just the same, with a slight difference. She pushed me to wear dresses and skirts all the time. I even caught her giving my pants away, so I didn't have a choice. She made me drink tea, even though I hated it, and always made me eat salads, even though I hated those too. I would sneak out of the house from time to time to get food I liked or go climb trees at the park. But when she caught me, she dragged me to some stuffy brunch with her tennis club friends. I talked to her about how much it bothered me that she tried to change me, and although she apologized and gave me a hug, she went right back to ballet lessons and such. One time I was picking flowers in the garden for a bouquet Serafina wanted me to arrange when I pricked my finger picking a rose. I hated the sight of blood, but I didn't have to look at it for long because a boy came running to my rescue. He took a band-aid out of his pocket and put it on my finger. He looked like he was my age. I was embarrassed of looking so weak because of a little prick, but he said, don't worry, it happens to me all the time, and showed me his hands full of little scratches and band-aids. We sat down on the grass beneath a tree for hours, just talking about nothing as kids do. His name was Jack and he was the gardener's son, which explained his rough hands. 
He helped out his dad after school. He was in the middle of telling me why the roses were his favorite when I heard Serafina calling my name from the mansion. So I had to say bye and ran to her. She saw the band-aid on my finger and asked me about it. I told her about Jack and blushed. But she didn't react the same as when my brothers told her about girls they liked. She shook her head and changed the subject. Jack and I became very close after that. I felt I could really be myself and goof around like a kid around him. When Serafina was busy, I would sneak off to the shed all the way at the edge of the property to hang out with Jack. He brought me snacks, we played games, and he even gave me a pair of pants that he had outgrown. I must have spent the entire day jumping and running around when I put on those pants. One night, Jack and his father stayed late at the mansion, and I stuck out of bed and climbed on the roof of the shed with Jack. He took my hand and showed me some constellations. The stars never looked so bright. They wouldn't look that bright again, at least not for a long time. But I didn't know that when I tucked myself back into bed, dreaming of Jack. Eight years later, I was a 17-year-old young woman. Not much had changed. I still had to wear dresses all the time, but Serafina couldn't get me to stop walking barefoot around the house no matter how much she chased me around. My 18th birthday was approaching, and so was my high school graduation. I often walked in front of my parents, pretending to accidentally drop college flyers and pamphlets everywhere, but they still wouldn't change their minds. They wouldn't let me apply to college. How am I ever going to find the kind of job I want without a degree? I asked them, but my father simply said, you won't need either of those from behind his newspaper. The mansion was always full of people now, everyone making preparations for my 18th birthday. I didn't get what all the fuss was about. I didn't even want a party, but Serafina insisted that it was necessary. The garden was my safe haven. That's where I would go whenever I felt frustrated or upset, which was now very often. There were at least a dozen gardeners fixing it up for my party, but I saw one messing with my territory. The roses were mine. I trimmed and took care of them myself, never letting anyone touch them. But one of the gardeners was just snipping away at them. I strutted up to him to tell him that those were off limits. But when he turned around, I dropped the apple I was munching. I hadn't seen those eyes in eight years. It was Jack. I squealed and hugged him tight and he hugged me back. Almost on instinct, we ran to the shed and sat crisscross in front of each other like we used to when we were kids. We couldn't stop smiling and didn't know what to say. He wasn't a little boy anymore. He was a grown man, and I was a grown woman. When we finally started talking, we didn't stop. We ended up laying on our back, still talking while staring at the ceiling. When it got dark, I went back to the house, but the light of the shed was still on, so I knew he must be there. I caught myself always glancing at it throughout the day and sometimes at night. I had my friend back. The night of my 18th birthday arrived. The mansion was full of dressed up people and classical music was being played live at all times. My parents had bought me a big poofy dress and heels that felt like stepping on nails. I could barely walk, but Serafina taught me to walk gracefully even when in pain. I had to do the thing where you walk down the stairs gracefully and everyone looks at you in awe. But to me, it felt everything but graceful. I nearly fell on my face. As soon as I was at the bottom of the stairs, my parents introduced me to a guy around my age. He was insanely handsome. His name was Alistair. He kissed my hand and then led me to the dance floor. I was in a trance. He moved gracefully and he was so good looking. But then he started talking. When I tell you I have never talked to a more annoying and self-absorbed person, I mean it. The guy was the absolute worst. I kept making faces at my brothers to get them to help me, but they just laughed until Serafina smacked their arms. When I finally escaped his clutches, Serafina pulled me aside. She then told me the words that nearly made me collapse. She said, You have to marry him. I mean it. I did almost collapse. She took me to my father's study and sat me down, explaining to me that if I married Alistair, our families would be forever bonded, especially in business where it was most important. I wanted to kick and scream because I could tell she was serious. When I was done crying, she gave me a look of pure pity and wiped my tears off my face. She led me back to the dance floor and I had to dance with Alistair again. You'd think he would ask his future wife a single question about herself, but he didn't. He just talked on and on about himself. At one point, the music stopped. 
the pit in my stomach told me what was about to happen. Alistair got on one knee and asked me to marry him. I didn't even say yes. I just nodded numbly. Everyone around us cheered, but as Alistair drew attention to himself, I told my brothers to say that I was unwell and ran to my room to cry and be alone. I looked out the window towards the shed. The light being off indicated he wasn't there, and even the stars seemed to cry with me. It was the night before my wedding. I had spent the day at a spa getting pampered, but no amount of baths and products could bring color back to my face. I knew Alistair was off at his bachelor party, doing who knows what, but I just wanted to be alone, until I saw a light in the shed at the end of the property. I snuck out of the house through the kitchen and ran as fast as I could to the shed. When Jack opened it, I flung myself into his arms and started crying. It's going to be okay, he said while rubbing my back. I noticed his voice was shaky. By the next day, I had run out of tears. I was dressed in a poofy white dress, so wide I couldn't fit through doors without a struggle. I was handed my bouquet and my adoptive father walked me down the aisle to the typical wedding music. People looked at me with adoration. Of course, Alistair was too busy checking his reflection in the pastor's glasses. As I walked down the aisle, I started imagining what my life would be like from that point onwards. And everything I saw in my future I hated. Suddenly, I realized I was 18. I was a grown woman. I was able to make my own decisions. I didn't have to marry this jerk if I didn't want to and I didn't want to. I handed my bouquet to the nearest guest and said, Wedding's cancelled. After that, I laughed and ran out. I knew exactly where I was going. I found Jack rubbing his eyes in the shed looking absolutely defeated. I ran up to him and hugged him tight. I smiled brightly at him and said, I didn't marry him. It was as if Jack came back to life because he picked me up, swung me around, and kissed me. We packed up everything we could as quickly as we could, but an enraged Alistair followed me. You think you can just ditch me? I own you, he shouted at me. I've owned you since that day at the zoo. And that's when I remembered. There was a boy that day at the zoo who kept following me around. His parents talked to my biological parents for a while, the ones who had abandoned me. And then his father handed my dad a check. Sometime after that, my parents left. You paid my parents to abandon me? I shouted back at him. I punched him square in the jaw and he fell backwards. Jack and I ran as fast as we could and got a cab to the train station. We ran through the station laughing at our situation. Me in a wedding dress and him in his shabby gardening clothes, running through a crowd carrying bags that were falling apart. I heard someone shout my name and saw my family and all the guests from the wedding running towards us. But Jack and I were faster. We got on the train just in time as all the guests shook their fists at us. A few months later, Jack and I were living in a little cottage by the sea. It was beautiful and it felt like home. Soon enough, I was gonna walk down the aisle again, but this time, seeing the future that I had dreamt of since that night on the roof of the shed.